He had a reputation for threatening inmates who complained too much, who insisted on extra attention. The fourteen-year-old girl in charge of the medical dispensary told the police that Moores had commented to her about the uselessness of the residents, adding that it would be a good thing to get rid of a few of them. If you don't stop making so much trouble, I'll send you to where there is more heat than you want. He had snapped at one ninety-one-year-old man. The elderly residents at the home told police they believed Moores had methodically been removing those who annoyed him. They recalled him warning one woman who kept ringing her bell, requesting assistance, that she would be sorry if she summoned him again. She'd continued calling him. The next day, she was dead. But another orderly told police that he believed Moore's had followed orders. Once the orderly had been summoned to help remove a dead patient from a room, when he reached the man's quarters, Moore's and Superintendent Adam Banger were standing by the bed together, talking. There was a corpse in the bed, and the room had a sharp, sweet chemical sting to it. What is it? He remembered asking, choking slightly. In answer, Moore's went to the window and threw it open. The superintendent lit a cigar, filling the air with the acrid burn of tobacco, erasing all trace of anything else. The district attorney agreed that such interviews were suggestive, but from where he stood, they weren't proof. Now that Moore's was in jail and the superintendent was locked up as a hostile and uncooperative witness, the mood at the odd fellow's home had reached a predictable level of hysteria. Some of these statements were undoubtedly true. But others might be mere dramatics. To prove that these elderly residents had been poisoned, they needed some solid evidence. No one, not even those who disliked him, claimed to have witnessed Moore's killing a patient with chloroform. Rumors, suspicions, and anecdotes, a confession by a suspect who might just be crazy, weren't enough to charge a man with murder. Why did you shift from arsenic to chloroform? The sheriff asked Moore's. I did it because patients had become more troublesome after they had been given arsenic than before," Moore's answered during a hearing. "No person was ever killed unless he was going to die. I did it to end their suffering." Investigators had thought at first that they could build their case on the arsenic murder. Arsenic is a tough, durable, metallic element. Traces of it could be found in corpses years after death. Their first plan was to dig up Moore's arsenic victim from the Bronx Cemetery and run tests on whatever remained, but to their dismay, they discovered that the home was in the habit of dosing patients with an arsenic tonic, meaning that even if they did find the poison in tissue, it wouldn't necessarily provide evidence of murder. As for chloroform, the coroner had sadly assured them all that there was no way, no way at all, to find evidence of it in a corpse. An autopsy, he said, was therefore a complete waste of time. We might do this in some cases, but Moore's has said that he chloroformed the persons he killed in Westchester, and the fact that a person has been chloroformed cannot be proven by an autopsy. Therefore, we can establish nothing by exhuming the bodies. Moore's may have given each of his victims a quart of chloroform, but we couldn't prove it by an autopsy. The worst case example concerning the failure of an autopsy after a chloroform death came out of New York City's criminal justice history. It was the case of Texas multimillionaire William Rice, who might or might not have been killed with chloroform as he lay sleeping in his Manhattan apartment. Rice died in the fall of 1900. The motive for his possible murder began with his decision some years earlier to found an educational institute in Houston. His fortune would eventually endow Rice University, but family members considered that his plans meant throwing their inheritance away. In fact, his wife, who died a few years before him, secretly made a will leaving her share of the estate to her relatives. As Texas was a community property state, her relatives then demanded half of Rice's own money. Rice was eighty-four years old, an ailing and cantankerous recluse, burrowed into luxurious retirement. But he wanted to be remembered. He wanted his millions to endow his educational dream, and he had no intention of further subsidizing his wife's grasping relatives. Through his lawyers, he stated that he hadn't been a resident of Texas for years. He lived in New York, which was not a community property state, and his greedy relatives by marriage—well, 
they could whistle for his money. His wife's family, equally determined, countered by hiring a New York lawyer named Albert Patrick, who had a reputation for playing dirty. With his clients living halfway across the country, Patrick decided to siphon off some of Rice's money for himself. He developed an alliance with Rice's valet, Charles Jones, and they collaborated on a forged will that divided the old man's assets among the eager heirs, Jones, and, of course, the attorney himself. The schemers then collaborated on getting rid of Rice. Or so Jones claimed. Once he was in jail, charged with chloroforming the old man at Patrick's bidding. The valet said he'd first tried mercury pills as a poison, but Rice seemed to thrive on them. So hearing the chloroform rapidly dissipated and left no evidence behind, he borrowed some from his brother, whose doctor had prescribed it as a sleep aid. According to his confession, Jones then put a chloroform-soaked sponge over his sleeping employer's face, anchored it with a heavy towel, and waited. Rice had died without a struggle, he claimed, and he burned the sponge and other equipment. Patrick arranged to have the body rushed to a crematorium. From that point on, apparently, everything went wrong for the conspirators. The undertaker embalmed the body instead of incinerating it. The bank challenged the forged will that Patrick had provided and contacted the police. The suspicious coroner demanded an autopsy. The city decided to prosecute. Police had the faked documents and a very dead millionaire. They then got Jones's confession. It seemed an easy path to conviction. They charged both Patrick and Jones with murder. As for Rice's body, city attorneys sent it to medical experts for what they expected to be a simple analysis. But the Rice case proved cursed to all associated with it. Rumors spread that the valet had blamed Patrick in order to save himself, that he was unstable, seeing plots where there were none. The will was plainly forged, but many began to wonder whether Jones had built an attention-grabbing fantasy around Rice's natural death. When questioned, the valet became hysterical and staged a hunger strike in his jail cell, spicing up all those rumors of his mental instability. Meanwhile, the autopsy result turned out to be a catalog of contradictions. The body had started to rot. The doctors couldn't agree on how decomposition affected chloroform chemistry in the body. They couldn't agree on how embalming had changed the chemistry either. By the time the trial was over... More than $30,000 had been spent on experts who agreed on, well, nothing. The autopsy, for instance, had found fluid in Rice's lungs. The defense called in one of the late President McKinley's doctors to assure jurors that chloroform was not a noxious, irritating substance that caused fluid to form in the lungs. The physician, while on the witness stand, pulled a small bottle of chloroform out of his pocket, held it under his tongue and his eyes, and declared that he hadn't felt a thing. The old man, he said, had died of pneumonia. It wasn't surprising that his lungs contained fluid. The physician was countered by a pathologist from Cornell who insisted that chloroform was strongly irritating and could rapidly cause the lungs to swell and fill. He blamed the poison, and the poison only, for Rice's congested lungs. The next witness contradicted the Cornell pathologist, and so it continued until the jury simply dismissed the medical evidence, voting for conviction based on the valet's testimony and the forged documents. Jones was sentenced to life in prison, and Patrick was sentenced to death and sent to Sing Sing Prison in 1902. But the convictions remained tainted by uncertainty. New York executions usually ticked along, Swiss clock efficient, but Patrick's date with the electric chair kept getting pushed back, after four years, the governor commuted his sentence to life, citing the unholy mess of medical arguments. And in 1912, Patrick was pardoned, based largely on new statements from medical experts, saying that the autopsy evidence was inconclusive about the poison in question. Doctors say chloroform didn't kill rice, the New York papers wrote. All these years later, no one was sure if New York had wrongly convicted an innocent man or let a murderer go free. That was the position they seemed to be in with Frederick Moores. They had no way to prove he was a murderer, and no way to be sure he wasn't. The Bronx district attorney decided that he had only one other avenue to pursue. If their self-confessed murderer really was crazy, 
if they could get a good alienist to diagnose him, they might not need the chloroform evidence. They could just have him safely put away. The DA decided to send the strange little suspect to Bellevue Hospital, home to the best psychopathic ward in the city and possibly the entire country. Like all other buildings in New York, Bellevue and Allied Hospitals wore a slick coat of ice that February, gleaming over the brick and stone, adding slippery polish to the wrought iron gates and curved staircases, a cold winter sheen to the sedately styled Victorian buildings. The Bellevue complex spread over four city blocks along the East River, built on land that had once nourished a farm called Bellevue for its beautiful prospect on the river. The first hospital building had been constructed there in 1811. Only eight years later, Bellevue became the first U.S. hospital to formally require a qualified physician to pronounce a death after a desperately ill man had been discovered among the corpses stacked on the morgue wagon. Its ambulance system had started in 1869. Its children's clinic, the first in the nation, in 1874. Its chest clinic, to combat tuberculosis, in 1903. It was, from the start, a public hospital. In the winter of 1915, nearly a thousand people were treated at Bellevue every day. It gathers the dead and dying from river and streets and is kept busy night and day with the misery of the living, wrote one New York Times reporter, attempting to capture the rather ominous mystique of the place. Some swore, peering through the black railings to the stone buildings with their arched windows and Corinthian columns, that the whole place was haunted. Stories still were told of the Bellevue Black Bottle of the late 19th century, containing a mysterious potion supposedly used to winnow out the poorest patients, and of the morgue there where, after a disaster, the bodies literally overflowed. In 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory building on Washington Square had burned. More than 100 young seamstresses had died. Their blackened bodies had been stacked like cordwood on the piers behind the hospital. Mothers from the Gas House District, the gritty, crime-ridden neighborhood just south of the hospital, used its name to threaten troublesome children. "'I'll send ye to Bellevue,' was almost as dreaded a warning as, "'I'll tell the Jerry Society on ye.' the nickname of the city's Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children, hated for its relentless policing tactics. The hospital's famed psychopathic ward, home to the lunatics, the crazies, the suicidal and the homicidal, only added to the rumors. Its windows were barred. Ivy climbed the stone walls. In the winter, their creepers tangled like old bones. Passers-by swore, swore that at night they could hear screams through the glass, see shadows stalking past the windows like unchained beasts. The current head of that ward, an alienist named Menace Gregory, had been trying for years to change that haunted reputation. He angrily defended people in his care, many of whom had been brought in against their will when their families had them declared crazy. The lost occupants of his ward needed help, Gregory argued, not mockery, not groundless fear. He worried at how slowly people accepted that, even in his own institution. There is, at the present time, no place where these patients may receive proper treatment. Unlike many late-night arrivals to the psychopathic ward, though, Moore seemed happy enough to be there, Gregory told the police. They let him bring a pile of books. He was teaching himself better English, and he spent most of his time lying on his cot, reading, muttering over pronunciations. At the end of ten days, Gregory agreed that Moore's was not well mentally. The man was definitely watchful, possibly a little paranoid. He seemed usually controlled, quiet and polite. Moore's was cold, calculating, and somehow just off, slightly inhuman in his reactions, but the alienists saw no evidence that their self-confessed murderer was delusional. It was extremely unlikely that he'd invented the killings, and he wouldn't call him a homicidal lunatic. Did that make him capable of planning multiple killings? The Bellevue experts could offer a definitive yes. Did that give the district attorney the proof he wanted? A definitive no. Yes, no, maybe, 
All the answers led them nowhere. Nowhere they wanted to be in a criminal investigation involving eight suspicious deaths. The Moore's investigators weren't the only ones stumbling their way through poison murders, but it wasn't particularly comforting to realize that. If anything, a newly published survey only made their situation seem worse. 